Communicate. Listening and speaking skills. Course book. CD two. Unit eight. Vocabulary. Exercise three. Qualifications in Britain used to depend completely on exam performance, but now more courses are assessed on a mix of coursework done over time and exams. In some subjects, up to forty percent of the final mark comes from continuous assessment of assignments. Students who get nervous doing exams have welcomed this change, because they feel that their average mark is better than their exam results. A levels are very important for getting into further education, so it's common for schools to have mock exams in January, to give students a chance to practice before they do the real thing in June. No one wants to do retakes, and many universities require specific A-level grades to get onto a course. So many students spend much of May and early June doing revision. Unit Eight: Speaking Exercises Two and Three. So, how are things different now you're a sixth former? Well, of course, the difference most people notice first. Is that we don't have to wear uniform? Yes, I hear that's pretty popular. That's right, and our timetable is more flexible. But I think there are also some important differences when it comes to the type of work we do. How do you mean? Well, a lot of the classes are more like lectures. The teachers tell you stuff, and you have to take notes. They don't tell you what to write. You have to decide. I suppose that's good preparation for university. Yes. And we also seem to be working more independently. The teachers set us homework assignments, which we have to go off and research. That must be pretty easy these days, with the internet and so on. Well, yes, but there's so much stuff to read that you have to be selective, or you can spend hours on it. And of course, you've got to summarise it all and put it in your own words, so as not to plagiarise. Well, that's good. I mean, you should think about it and write your own ideas, not just copy what someone else says. Yes, but it's not always easy. What about exams? Do you have a lot of them? Well, yes. Between mock exams in January and final exams in June, and then tests every month or so, there always seem to be exams round the corner. Either you're revising for them, or you're doing them. But isn't there more emphasis on continuous assessment these days? Yes, I think coursework is more important, and I think that's a good thing. At least your grades don't just depend on exams. I mean that. Can... Unit eight: Pronunciation. Exercise A. Some. Ah. Here. Your, where, right. Unit eight, listening, exercise two. Good morning and welcome. I'm Alice Howe, your head teacher, and I'm here today to give you some advice about study skills as you start in the sixth form. One of the main differences is that in the sixth form you have fewer subjects, but hopefully these are things that you personally are more interested in and have chosen to study. You'll have more time to spend on each of them, but you'll also have to work more independently. This means that time management is everyone clear what I mean by time management is very important. Make a note of deadlines and plan your work accordingly. Use lists to tick off assignments, homework, exercises, essays, and so on. When you finish them, and remember that it's better to study and review on a regular basis than to leave it all to revision just before the exams. It's easy to leave things till the last minute. Remember that in the sixth form, you'll also have opportunities to do other optional activities, get a part-time job, or learn to drive, as well as having a busy social life. The better you organize your time, the more things you'll be able to do.
Effective research is a very important skill. Now, what do I mean by effective research? Well, what I'm talking about is organized study. It's easy to waste a lot of time, and it's also easy to get distracted when using the internet. Try not to download page after page. Be selective. It's also important to remember that not everything on the internet is true. Pages like Wikipedia are created through collaboration, and no one checks the contents. Try to read, think critically, and then take notes. If you do this, you'll be expressing your own ideas rather than someone else's. Note taking is in itself a very important skill. There's no one correct way to do this. You have to find what suits you. Some people write detailed notes using full sentences. Others note key words or write the most important information using bullet points. More visual learners may prefer to use mind maps. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that it works for you and provides a summary of the main information which you can use for revision. Unit eight, listening, exercise five. Note taking is in itself a very important skill. There's no one correct way to do this. You have to find what suits you. Some people write detailed notes using full sentences. Others note key words or write the most important information using bullet points. More visual learners may prefer to use mind maps. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that it works for you and provides a summary of the main information which you can use for revision. Unit eight, pronunciation, exercises A and B. I'm here to help you study better. You'll have to think fast and work hard. Try not to worry too much. You have chosen to do a difficult subject. It's easy to forget the simplest things. Unit eight, final task, exercise one. Speaker one. The really important thing about presenting a project in class is that you've got to be calm. It's easy to get nervous. Avoid the temptation to read from your notes. Try to memorize the main points and talk directly to your audience. Remember, a good presentation can inspire people. Speaker two. Good morning. I'm here today to talk about how to do a successful presentation. A good presentation should sound natural to an audience. It's easy to read sentences that sound okay in writing, but don't sound natural in an oral presentation. Use short sentences. Use everyday expressions to make an impact. Use images to support what you say. Try not to put too many words on your PowerPoint presentation. Finish by repeating your main message. A good presentation should entertain and inform your audience. I hope I did that. Thank you for your attention. Unit nine, speaking, exercise one. Well, it's eleven o'clock on Tuesday, April the twelfth, and you're listening to Capital City, the first internet radio for English speakers living in Madrid. And I'm Sean Mulligan. Today, we're talking about Spanish government plans to change the driving laws. Here's what one local teenager had to say to our reporter on the streets of Madrid, Tom Langley. Good morning. Can I ask you a question? You may have heard the Spanish government is thinking about allowing young people to start learning to drive at 17. What do you think of that? I don't know. 
I don't think we need to learn to drive at 17. I live in the city and public transport is great, so I'm not in a rush to learn to drive. I think if people of my age could drive, there would be more accidents than now. Unit 9. Speaking. Exercise 3. Well, it's 11 o'clock on Tuesday, April the 12th, and you're listening to Capital City, the first internet radio for English speakers living in Madrid. And I'm Sean Mulligan. Today, we're talking about Spanish government plans to change the driving laws. Here's our reporter, Tom Langley, to tell us more about it. Thanks, Sean. Today, there are many similarities between learning to drive in Spain and in Britain. You have to do a theory and a practical test in both countries, for example. But there are still two important differences between being a learner driver in Spain and in Britain. The first is age. In Britain, you can start learning when you're 17, although the government is considering changing this to 18, like in Spain. The other important difference is who you learn with. In Britain, when you decide to learn to drive, you don't have to have lessons with a driving instructor. Any qualified driver over the age of 21 can teach you. And in fact, many young people put the L plates on the family car and learn with one of their parents. Learning to drive is a very expensive business. And this is, of course, a great way to keep costs down. And now a similar scheme is under discussion in Spain. The traffic department's plan is for young people to start the process at the age of 17 with theory and practical classes at a recognised driving school. When they pass the theory test, they can continue practising with a qualified driver until they are 18 and can take the practical part of the driving test. But what do young people think of it? I don't know. I don't think we need to learn to drive at 17. I live in the city and public transport is great, so I'm not in a rush to learn to drive. I think if people of my age could drive, there would be more accidents than now. Young boys can be really irresponsible. Most people who break the speed limit and jump the traffic lights tend to be under 20. Well, that's the opinion of one 17-year-old here. But how representative is that? Studies in other European countries have looked at this scheme and discovered that it actually has a very positive impact on the number of traffic accidents. And that can only be a good thing. Now, back to Sean in the studio. Unit 9. Pronunciation. Exercise A. Decide. Decided. Qualify, qualified. Pass, passed. Interest, interested. Unit 9, pronunciation, exercise B. Started. Played. Bored. Visited. Frightened, studied, excited, learned. Unit 9. Listening. Exercises 1 and 2. Bath is a city located in southwest England in the county of Somerset. With a population of 83,000, Bath isn't one of Britain's largest cities, but the 3.8 million yearly visitors make it one of England's most popular tourist destinations. It's been popular for a long time. The Romans built a temple and spa baths in AD 70 when they discovered Britain's only hot spring. Even though the Roman baths are now six metres below the street level of the modern city, over a million tourists come every year to visit them. Bath is famous for its fabulous Georgian architecture. 
Many films have been shot in locations such as the Royal Crescent, a series of terraced houses built between 1767 and 1774, and the Assembly Rooms, which were popular with fashionable people in 18th-century Bath and now house the city's fashion museum. Bath was the home of 19th-century novelist Jane Austen, author of Pride and Prejudice, who lived in the city for over five years. Some of her most famous novels actually take place in the city, and her characters describe many of the places that modern visitors can still see today. Other places of interest include Bath Abbey, which was built on the site of an 8th-century Anglo-Saxon church, and the 200-year-old Theatre Royal. Selected as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1987. Bath is recognised as one of Britain's most culturally significant places. Unit nine, listening, exercise three. One. Okay, so leave the station and go straight ahead into Manvers Street. Carry on straight across at North Parade. Oh, the street name changes from Manvers Street. To Pierpoint Street, but it's all the same road. That brings you to Orange Grove. There, you want to take the second left, and it's right opposite you. Two. Right, you need to turn left out of the station into Dorchester Street, and then you'll see a big junction on your right. With Saint James Parade and Southgate, go up Southgate. It's where all the shops are, and it's pedestrianised. No cars are allowed up there. Keep straight on into Stall Street, and then take the second right, and they're on the left, opposite the tourist information office. Three. Okay. It's a little bit complicated. Turn left out of the station and go right at the first junction. You'll come to a fork with Corn Street on the left and St James Parade on the right. Take St James Parade. Take the first right into Hot Bath Street. <laughs> Great name, isn't it? And when you come to Westgate Street, turn left. Follow the road round to the right into Barton Street, and it's on your left. Unit nine, functional language, exercise four. Hi, I want to get to the Postal Museum. Okay, well you need to turn left out of the station, and then take the first right into Southgate. First left into South. No, first right. <laughs> okay, then you go straight up Stall Street. Stall Street. No, Stall Street. S T A L L. Okay, Stall Street. Go straight ahead across Westgate Street and Upper Borough Walls until you come to New Barn Street, where you turn left. And follow the road round. Sorry, New New Bond Street.、Oh. Turn left and follow the road round, and then take the first right into Green Street. The museum's on your right, on the corner with Broad Street. Okay, terrific. Thanks. Unit nine pronunciation exercises A and B. No first right. No Stall Street. New Bond Street. Unit nine, final task, exercise one. Speaker A. Excuse me, could you please tell me the fastest route to take to the airport? Excuse me. Would I be right in thinking the train station is further along this road? Speaker B, excuse me, sorry. The best way to the sea. Hi, is the post office near here? 
Unit 10. Prepare to describe a photo. Exercises 4 and 5. OK. Well, both pictures are photos of people, and in both cases they seem to be having a good time. However, there's an important difference between them, and that's the age of the people in the pictures. The main subject of the top photo is a woman, well, a lady. She looks quite old, whereas the bottom photo is of a toddler. The lady must be in her 60s, I guess. You can tell she's old because she's got lots of wrinkles, but she also looks like a very happy person. She's got wavy blonde hair, brown eyes, I think, and laughter lines round her eyes. She seems to be at some kind of family get-together with a young girl. Maybe it's her granddaughter or something. That's another important difference between the two photos. The woman is with other people, but the baby is on his own. The main thing we can see in the second picture is a baby or small child. I think he's between one and two years old. He's got chubby cheeks, light brown hair and twinkling brown eyes. I don't think he's Spanish. He could be from somewhere in the north of Europe or somewhere. He's playing with a teddy bear. I imagine both people are enjoying themselves. The old lady because she's surrounded by her family and the little boy because he's enjoying playing with his bear. Unit 10. Prepare to talk about a proposal. Exercise 4. Fame has many negative effects on society. For a lot of young people, becoming famous is their goal in life. TV makes it look easy, so they give up studying in order to follow their dream. But becoming a top football player, singer or actor is extremely difficult, and only a very small number will make it. It also seems that nowadays it doesn't matter what you're famous for. It's being famous that matters. This means that people will do all kinds of things simply to be on TV. In the past, people achieved fame through hard work and success. But now you can become a public figure just by marrying someone famous or because you're prepared to talk about your personal problems in front of a national audience. Another consequence is that this desire to become famous and our obsession with fame has led in turn to an increase in poor quality TV programs, like reality shows and talk shows, and also in sales of gossip magazines, which only exist to promote fame. However, on a more positive note, many people who are famous have worked hard to get to the top of their field. Sportsmen and women, actors and other performers often spend many years training and studying, and this dedication is a good example for younger people. Another thing we mustn't forget is that watching top-level performance brings pleasure to thousands of people. Many famous people dedicate time to their fans and recognize the responsibilities that come with fame. On top of this, there are those who use their fame to bring public attention to people in need. Some are involved in charity work or work as ambassadors for organizations such as UNICEF. We may criticize their high salaries but if they help others and set a good example, then their fame has a positive impact on society as a whole. To sum up, I think that fame has both positive and negative effects. In my view, the problem does not lie with those who are famous as the result of hard work and achieving excellence in their field, but with the attitude encouraged by the media that what matters is fame itself. For me, the root of the problem lies in the increasing number of public figures 
who were famous without deserving it, and the desire of many others to follow their example. Unit ten, prepare to do a project. Exercise two. Did you see that program on Channel Four? Um, what's it called? Battlefront. No. What's it about? It's about this project that started online to show that individuals and young people can make a difference.、Mm, what do you mean? Well, they had these twenty people, and each of them had chosen some type of issue or subject that they felt strongly about. Okay. And what happened next? Well, they each started an online campaign to get people to think about the issue and then convince them to change. What sort of thing? Let's see.、Um, there was one guy campaigning against smoking in cars because he has asthma. Another trying to stop people wearing headphones when crossing the road. What? Like on your iPod or something? Why? Because nearly a hundred people die in traffic accidents in Britain every day, and this guy's sure that in some cases they just couldn't hear what was going on because of their headphones.、Oh. What else? There was a girl campaigning against these extremely thin size zero models because she'd had a friend with anorexia. Okay. Oh yeah, and a guy from London campaigning against knife and gun crime after a nineteen-year-old friend of his was killed. Wow, some pretty heavy stuff. Well, yeah, but it was really interesting. You know, they had to set up websites, come up with slogans. Raise money, contact journalists, print T-shirts, all kinds of stuff.、Hmm. Sounds interesting. Well, they've got some of the videos and lots more information on www.battlefront.co.uk. You should check it out. Unit Eleven, Speaking, Exercise Four. Cup and saucer. Knife and fork. Strawberries and cream, fish and chips, bread and butter, bangers and mash, salt and pepper, bacon and eggs. Unit Eleven, speaking, Exercise Six. Dialogue One. Excuse me. Yes, the、uh, apple pie. Does it contain nuts?、Mm, sorry, I, I can't eat nuts. A are there any in the apple pie? Uh, I don't think so. Let me just check for you. Dialogue two. Morning, Marissa. Did you sleep okay? Yes, fine, thanks. I've cooked you a full English breakfast. Bacon and eggs with all the trimmings for your first day here. Oh, uh, thanks. There's salt and pepper here. You can get your own bread and butter if you want some, and there's a cup and saucer there for your tea. Um, I don't normally eat a cooked breakfast. Could I just have some toast? Dialogue three. How are your strawberries and cream? Really nice, thanks. How's the chocolate cake? Hmm, it's a bit rich actually. Do you want to try? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I see what you mean. Oh, that's quite sickly, isn't it? <laughs> yes, a bit too sweet for me. Unit Eleven. Pronunciation. Exercise A. Allergy. Greasy, juice, vegan. Unit Eleven. Pronunciation. Exercise B. Vegetarian. Gluten. Burger. Sausages. Unit Eleven. Listening. Exercise three. In the U.S. in the mid 1950s, 
McDonald's only had one portion size for its French fries. That size was called small. Since then, portions have been getting bigger. Today's large weighs the same as the 1998 super size. The sizes of fast food portions in Europe are smaller than those in the United States. An extra large cola in London, Rome, and Dublin is only a large in the U.S. Unit Eleven, Listening, Exercises Four and Five. Next, please. Oh, hi. I'd like two bacon cheeseburgers and a chicken salad, please. Is that to eat in or take out? Eat in, please. Do you want any fries with that? Yeah, three regular chips,、uh, fries. And to drink? Yes, I'd like a bottle of water, a diet coke, and an orange Fanta. Would you like those drinks regular or large? Um, regular, please. Anything else with that? Onion rings, chicken wings? No, I think that's all. Actually, give us some onion rings. Okay, that's fifteen pounds forty pence exactly.、Mm. Here you go. And sixty pence change makes sixteen pounds. Okay, two burgers, a chicken salad, three fries, onion rings, and three drinks. Cheers. Oh, could I have some ketchup and mustard, please? Sure. Here you are. Ah, here you are. So that's a bacon cheeseburger for you, John, with Fanta, right? That's it. And you and yours was a chicken salad with water. Thanks. What do I owe you? No, my treat. You can pay another day. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Cheers, Joe. Oh, this is great. I'm starving.、Oh, me too. I think we deserve this after all that football. <laughs> <laughs> Unit Eleven, Pronunciation, Exercise A. Excuse me. Breakfast. Drinks. Baked beans. Actually. Exactly. Unit Eleven, Pronunciation, Exercise B. Vegetables. Sandwich. Oranges. Biscuits. Crisps. Unit Eleven. Final task. Exercise One. Good evening, Marcos Pizza. Hi. I'd like to order a pizza. And is this for home delivery or to collect? Excuse me. I'm sorry. Would you like to collect your pizza, or do you want us to deliver it to your house? Good evening, Marcos Pizza. Hi. I want to order two pizzas, please. Sure. Is that traditional or deep pan crust? I beg your pardon. I'm sorry. How would you like your pizza? Would you like the base to be deep, or do you prefer a thin, more traditional style of pizza? Unit Eleven, review, exercise two. One. This is a meal that somebody else has prepared to eat at home or to take somewhere else to eat. Two. This is a medical condition. When you react badly to a particular food, nuts, for example. Three. This adjective is used to describe food that is very spicy. Four. We use this expression to describe a person who likes eating chocolate, biscuits, and desserts. Five. This is what tells you how much your food costs. Six. A quantity of food is measured by the size of this. Unit Eleven. Review. Exercise Four B. 
Regular. Orange juice. Vegetarian. Sausages. Produced. Greasy. Unit 11. Review. Exercise 5B. Hi, I'd like a chicken salad sandwich to eat in. Sure. Do you want brown or white bread? Brown, please. Anything else with that? Could I have a cappuccino, please? Is that a regular or large cappuccino? Regular, please. OK. That's £4.59, please. Here you are. Thanks. Unit 12. Vocabulary. Exercise 4. It's legal for British teenagers to take a part-time job from the age of 13. At 13, you can't work night shifts. You have to start work after 7am and finish before 7pm. You can do a maximum of two hours a day in term time and up to 25 hours per week in the holidays. Saturday jobs in clothes shops, supermarkets and music stores are popular with 15 and 16 year olds who are allowed to work up to eight hours on a Saturday. Many also take a holiday job for part of the school holidays when they can work up to 35 hours per week. Some teenagers work cash in hand for family members or local businesses and don't declare their earnings. But most young people have similar conditions to adult workers. They have to make national insurance contributions. But because young people work a limited number of hours, they are often exempt from paying tax. Unit 12. Speaking. Exercises 2 and 3. 1. Hi, I'm Shahid. I'm 14. I do a paper round every morning before I go to school. I walk round and deliver newspapers to people's houses. It's a good way to get some extra spending money, but I don't like having to get up so early. 2. My name's Lucy. I've got a Saturday job in H&M. I'm saving up to go on holiday with my friends next summer. My colleagues are a real laugh and I get a discount on the things I buy in the store. But working in a shop means I end up spending too much money on clothes. 3. My name's Henry. I'm a student and I'm not studying in my hometown, so it's really expensive paying for my university tuition, accommodation and general living expenses. Last Christmas I had a holiday job teaching snowboarding in a ski resort. That was brilliant fun, but after tax and national insurance deductions, I didn't actually take home that much money. 4. Hi, I'm Natalie. My mum and dad have a pub and I sometimes work there at weekends or when they need me to. It's not official, I get paid cash in hand, so the money's quite good. But it's really tiring being on your feet all evening. Unit 12. Pronunciation. Exercise B. Birthday. 4. Her. Learn. More. Skirt. Talk. Water. Word. Unit 12. Listening. Exercises 3 and 4. Hi there. Well, I'm joined in the studio today by Rose Mercer from the Employment Services Board, and she's here to tell us about vacation jobs for teens. Rose, hi. Hello, Dan. So, to start with, Rose, why is it a good idea for our teenage listeners to get a summer job? Well, apart from the obvious financial advantage of earning some money, getting a summer job is a great way to pick up some first-hand experience of the world of work. It teaches responsibility, 
And it certainly looks great on your resume when you start looking for a serious job after college. So, what kind of employment options do our teenage listeners have? Well, I'm going to tell you about two classic options for the summer vacation. And the first of these is being a lifeguard. Oh, sure. Now, that must be a great job. You just sit on a high chair and get a suntan, right? <laughs> well, no, there's a little more to it than that. <laughs> Obviously, the basic requirement for becoming a lifeguard is that you are a good swimmer, but you also need to do extensive training. However, a lot of people don't realize what else is involved in being a lifeguard. Like what? If one of our listeners was thinking about becoming a lifeguard, what else would they have to take into account? Well, that depends on where you work. If you get a job in a hotel pool or a small community pool, then it can be quite relaxing. And of course, you work independently. But if you work in a big water park, you'll be part of a team and work with hundreds of kids. It's quite hard work. And what about the beach? Could I go and get a job with Pamela Anderson? <laughs> <laughs> well, beach lifeguarding is very well paid, but you have to pass a lot of physical tests and be in top condition to have a chance at getting a job. Okay. So, what's the other option? Well, another great all-American vacation job is being a camp counselor. This means working as a part of a team of leaders on one of the nation's hundreds of summer camps for kids. What type of person do you need to be? Well, again, the basic requirements are quite obvious. You'll be working with kids, so you'll need to have a lot of patience and like being around kids, of course. But another thing to bear in mind is that camp organizers prefer to employ people who have a particular skill, like the ability to play music or be good at sports or arts and crafts. And do you have to work long hours? Oh, yes. It's a full-time job and then some. <laughs> What's the money like? Well, the money's not great if you consider the long hours you have to work. You'll be on call and may have to work 24-7. But remember, your food and accommodation are free. What's more, you can have a great time living away from your parents. Okay. That's two great suggestions for earning some extra dollars during the vacations. Now we're going to talk about social... Unit 12. Pronunciation. Exercise A. Requirements. Resume. Attendant. Curriculum. Assistant. Admission. Repetitive. Unit 12. Final task. Strategy box. The money's not great, but your food and accommodation are free. Unit 12. Review. Exercise 1. Holiday job. Employee. Part-time job. Boss. Colleague. Earnings. Employer. Pay tax. Spending money. Work shifts. Work cash in hand. Unit 12. Review. Exercise 2. 1. Work. 2. Bought. 3. Saw. 4. Burn. 5. Bird. 6. 4.
Unit 13. Vocabulary. Exercise 3. Taking a gap year is now an increasingly popular activity for many young people in Britain, according to a recent report. Every year, around a quarter of school leavers who are going on to university decide to defer the start of their course and take a year out before starting their degree course. Some do it to get work or life experience. Others just want to take a break from their studies. Some teenagers spend the year volunteering in schools, hospitals or NGOs in the UK or abroad. Others prefer to spend part of the year working to save up money and then spend several months travelling. South America, Asia and Australia are popular destinations. Gap years aren't only for school leavers. Some people take a career break later in life, but they are certainly most popular with 16 to 25-year-olds. Annually, around 250,000 British people in this age group take a gap year. It's very popular in countries like Britain and Australia and becoming more typical in the US. But in other countries, like Japan, there's more pressure on young people to go straight from education into employment. Unit 13. Speaking. Exercise 3. 1. Hello, my name's Jack. I decided to take a year out and come to Australia before I start studying to be a vet next autumn. I'm spending six months working on a sheep station. It's great work experience and has changed my views about our relationships with animals a lot. 2. Hi, Chantal here. I wanted to make my gap year count. I've taken a break from my studies, but I don't want to waste my time. I'm going to do business studies next year, so I was really pleased to get a job in an advertising agency. It's really changed my attitude to work. 3. Hi, this is Michelle. I wanted to make a difference, so I'm spending three months in Namibia working as a teacher's assistant in a primary school. It's an amazing experience and a real eye-opener. I'm pleased to be spending part of my gap year volunteering. It makes me feel I'm making a contribution in some way. When I finish here, I'm going on a trip round southern Africa. 4. Hi, my name's Sarah. Last summer I went interrailing round Europe and had a brilliant time, so I decided to spend my gap year travelling. I had a Saturday job all the way through sixth form and I worked in a factory for three months to save up for the trip. I spent a month in Indonesia and now I'm in Thailand. I'm having an amazing time. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience really and has totally changed my perspective on life. Unit 13. Pronunciation. Exercise A. I decided to take a year out and come to Australia before I start studying to be a vet next autumn. Unit 13. Pronunciation. Exercise C. I'm going to do business studies next year, so I was really pleased to get a job in an advertising agency. Unit 13. Listening. Exercise 2. So, Raquel, you spent last year in Ireland on an Erasmus programme. Can you tell us something about that? Well, it was a fantastic experience, one that I'd really recommend to other students. Why is that exactly? Well, I think it's brilliant to have the chance to live in a different country. You realise that a lot of the things you thought were incredibly complicated are quite fun. You learn so many things. First of all, English, I imagine. Well, the great thing about studying in Galway was that even though the language of the university was English, I also learned one or two words and phrases in Gaelic. That's the original language of the people of Ireland, you know? Mm -hmm. Of course... In everyday situations, in shops and stuff, 
most people spoke English, but you can sometimes hear Gaelic spoken in the bars. The one word that everybody learns there is slancha, which means cheers in Irish. <laughs> Tell me about the people you met. Well, I was living in a student residence. There were eight of us sharing a kitchen and living room. Three Irish students, and the rest were from France, Holland, two from Romania, and, well, me and one other student from Spain. That must have been interesting. It was. I think that was one of the best things about the whole experience, meeting people from other places and opening up my perspective on life. Also, in Madrid, it's just me and my family, so just the whole experience of living with other people was a real eye-opener. It really taught me a lot. And I imagine it was interesting attending a foreign university. Yes, that was very interesting. The style of the classes was quite different. In GMIT, the teaching was more practical, more hands-on, whereas in Madrid, we spent more time listening and taking notes. I suppose the level is higher in our universities at home. I mean, what you have to do in Ireland is a bit easier, but doing it in another language makes it difficult. What were the main differences you noticed between life in Galway and in Madrid? Wow, there's so many, it's difficult to know where to start. One thing was that the day was so much shorter in winter. It was dark by 4 p.m. And then Ireland is loads more expensive than Spain. They say it's even more expensive than London. Can you give us any examples? Well, when I was there, a small bottle of Coke cost two euros twenty. And a beer cost about five euros. Right. So, do you have any regrets? None at all. <laughs> I don't know. It was just a real turning point for me. I think if I'd stayed here, I wouldn't have learned half the things I did. Unit 13. Functional Language. Exercise 1. Can you tell us something about that? Why is that exactly? First of all, English, I imagine. Tell me about the people you met. That must have been interesting. And I imagine it was interesting attending a foreign university. What were the main differences you noticed between life in Galway and in Madrid? Can you give us any examples? Do you have any regrets? Unit 13. Functional Language. Exercise 4. Can you tell me something about your trip to Marrakesh? Well, it was amazing. Everything was so different. Can you give us any examples? Well, the people, the way of life, even the shopping. Oh, yes. Tell me about the markets. Well, the markets are incredible. They're huge. It's really easy to get lost. You can buy all kinds of clothes, bags. Wow! And it must be cheaper than here. Yes, but you have to haggle. You know, argue about the price. I don't think I'd be good at that. Was there anything you didn't like? Well, it is quite stressful. It's all very fast-moving and in-your-face, so it's not the most relaxing type of holiday, but it was a brilliant experience. Unit 13. Pronunciation. Exercise A. That must have been interesting. That must have been interesting. Unit 13. Final task. Exercise 1. Interview 1. So, I see you took a year out. Can you tell me something about it and what you got out of it? I went interrailing round Eastern Europe. It was amazing. I met loads of people. We were partying all the time. And it was dead cheap. In Estonia, you could get beer for the equivalent of 75 cents. 
Interview two. So I see you took a year out. Can you tell me something about it and what you got out of it? I went interrailing round Eastern Europe. It was really interesting. I met lots of people from different countries, which meant I got to practice my languages, and it also opened up my perspectives. You know, I got to see life from another point of view. It was also the first time I'd been away from home and had to look after myself, so it taught me a lot about being organised and managing my money. Unit thirteen, review, exercise four. One. I had a Saturday job all the way through sixth form, and I worked in a factory for three months to save up for the trip. Two. Going to study at a university in another city and finding somewhere to stay there is a real challenge. Three. I think it's brilliant to have the chance to live in a different country. Four. It's incredible. You go into a market and you realise it's huge. It's really easy to get lost. Unit fourteen. Vocabulary exercise four. The first thing you need to know about travel in the UK is that there are several railway companies offering different prices and options. It's important to ask for the best deal before you buy your ticket. Normally, the ticket clerk will give you a standard ticket, so please tell them if you want to travel first class. The time you travel is also a factor. For example. If you're coming back to the departure station on the same day as your outward journey, you should ask for a day return. But if you're going to come back days or weeks later, you need a period return. Students should bear in mind that they will often pay a cheaper fare if they can demonstrate that they are in full-time education through showing a student travel card. Unit fourteen, speaking, exercise one. Dialogue one. Wait behind the line, please. Okay. Next. How long are you going to be in Britain? Three weeks. Okay. Next, please. Dialogue two. Excuse me, I've just arrived from Madrid. Where will our suitcases come in? Iberia from Madrid, number four. Okay, thanks. Dialogue three. Excuse me, where can I get a train into the centre of London? You need to go down this tunnel here to Heathrow Central Station. Thanks. Unit fourteen, speaking. Exercises three and four. Hi, I want to get into the centre of London by train. Okay, you've got three different options. It really depends how much you want to pay and how quickly you want to get there. Could you tell me the difference between them, please? Sure. Okay, so the fastest service is the Heathrow Express.、Uh -huh. That's a direct, non-stop train. There's a train every 15 minutes between here and Paddington Mainline Station, where you can change onto the Tube for other destinations in London. The journey time is between 15 and 20 minutes. Okay, sounds good. And the ferries. A single ticket is sixteen pounds fifty. Anything cheaper? Well, there's another train also to Paddington. That's the Heathrow Connect.、Oh. Heathrow Connect. Okay.、Um, how often does that go? There's a train every thirty minutes. That's a stopping service, but in fact, it only stops at five stations on the way, so it's still pretty quick. Takes about twenty-five minutes. And how much does that cost? Oh,、uh, let's see.、Um, a single is six pounds ninety. Okay, that's getting better. 
You said there were three options. Yep. Well, the third is to take the tube, the underground. I guess that takes quite a bit longer. Yes. There's a train every ten minutes or so, but the journey's somewhere between fifty minutes and an hour. Of course, it might suit you if you don't want to go all the way into Paddington. Um, I'm going to Brixton. Okay. Well, you're probably better off taking the tube then. So from here, it's the Piccadilly line eastbound, and then change at Green Park, and take the Victoria line southbound to Brixton. That's great. Good. Oh, how much does it cost? A single is. Four pounds, but if you're going to stay in London, then you might want to get an Oyster card. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Unit fourteen. Pronunciation. Exercise A. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Thirty. Forty, fifty. Unit fourteen. Pronunciation. Exercise B. Thirteen, seventy, eighty, fourteen, sixteen. Unit fourteen. Listening. Exercise one. Hey Maria, hi. This is Ravi. Can't wait to see you tomorrow. I thought we could take a walk through the shambles when you get here. I know how much you like it, especially the shops. Or if you're tired, we can just hang out in one of those cafes near York Minster. See how you feel when you get here. Safe trip. Unit fourteen. Listening. Exercise two. I'd like to book a seat to York next Tuesday. York, is that、uh, morning or evening? Uh, morning, please. Okay, there's a bus at nine thirty. What time does that get into York? Let's see. The journey time is five hours and fifteen minutes, so you should get in about two forty-five. Okay, that sounds good. How much is it? Do you want a single or a return? A、uh, return, I guess. The thing is, I don't know exactly which day I'm coming back. Well, I can make that an open return for you. Open return? Yes, it means you can travel back any time in the next month. You just validate the ticket before you travel. Okay, I'll take an open ticket. So, how much is that? Do you have a young person's coach card? No. Well, the normal adult fare is thirty-six pounds fifty, but with the coach card, it's thirty-one pounds ninety-five. And how much is the coach card? Ten pounds a year. If you do a couple more journeys like this, you'll cover the cost. Uh, well, no, I don't think so. I don't live in Britain, so I don't think I'll use it again. Okay, no problem. That's thirty-six pounds fifty, then, please. Would you like a window or an aisle seat? Sorry. Do you want to sit next to the window? Uh, yeah. Go on. Here you are. That's forty pounds. Okay. Here's your ticket and your change. Where does it leave from?、Uh, just over there,、uh, Bay Thirteen. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Next. Unit Fourteen. Listening. Exercise Three. Hello. Hey, Ravi. It's Maria. Maria, how are you doing? Good. Listen, I've booked the coach for next Tuesday. Cool. What time shall we expect you? I'm getting the 9:30 from Victoria, and it should get in just before three. Let's see. Yeah, 2:45. Okay, great. I'll come down and meet you. Brilliant. I'll send you a text message to let you know if the bus is going to be late. You know, because of traffic or something. Okay, good idea. Looking forward to seeing you. Unit fourteen. Pronunciation. Exercise B. 
Bay. Arrivals. Rail. Isle. Main. Isle. Train. Line. Unit 14. Final task. Exercise 1A. 1. Is that morning or evening? 2. Do you want a single or a return? 3. Would you like a window or an aisle seat? Unit 14. Review. Exercise 4B. Train. Plane. Rate. Validate. Aisle. Bay. Buy. Unit 15. Prepare to describe a photo. Exercise 2. In the first picture, I can see lots of people. They've got signs, and I think it's a demonstration. In the second, there are lots of people going shopping. They're trying to buy something cheap. They don't look very happy. Maybe they're just busy. <laughs> I don't like either situation, but maybe I'd choose the demonstration. Unit 15. Prepare to describe a photo. Exercises 3A and 3B. Let me see. Well, both pictures show us big groups of people and signs that show what they're doing. In the first picture, the people are doing something together as a group. In the second one, they're all individuals out shopping. I think the first picture is of some kind of demonstration. The people are carrying those oh, things, I'm not sure what they're called, but they're like big signs and when people are on strike or holding some kind of demonstration, they write slogans on them. I don't really know what it's about, but I imagine it's some kind of protest. It could be against pay cuts or to do with jobs or maybe the environment or something. I imagine they feel quite strongly about it. I've never been on a demonstration like this. I guess it's a good way to show how you feel, but I'm not sure if they achieve anything. Hmm. The second picture also shows a crowd, but it's quite a different situation. I'm not too sure, but I think it's when they reduce the prices so you can buy something half price or with a big discount. <sighs> it all looks a bit boring to me, and I don't think I'd like to be there. But maybe the people are happy if they've been able to buy something they really want a lot cheaper than normal. I think both pictures show us people trying to get something. In the first case, they could be trying to improve their working conditions or something. But in the second one, their goal is to buy something. I wouldn't especially like to be in either situation. But if I had to choose, then maybe I'd say the first one, because it would be an opportunity to show how you feel and to be with other people who feel the same. I really hate shopping, so I don't think I'd ever be in the second situation. Unit 15. Prepare to have a formal debate. Exercise 2. A debate is basically an argument. This doesn't mean that it's an undisciplined shouting match between two people with opposite views. On the contrary, a formal debate has a strict organisation, with roles for each of the speakers. For many people, debating is a hobby, and there are debating clubs round the world where people practice and try to improve their debating performance. The subject for discussion is called the motion. The motion is often an issue of current public interest or a general philosophical statement, 
For example, beauty is better than brains. Two teams argue the motion. Those in favour of the statement are known as the affirmative, and the team arguing against the topic is called the negative. Debating is a team event, normally consisting of three speakers in a team. Each person has a clear role, and their arguments should support each other. In general terms, the debate consists of presenting the team's arguments and rebuttal. Rebuttal means criticizing the arguments of the other team. There are three things to remember about rebuttal. The first is that it must be logical. To say that the other side is wrong is not enough. You have to show why the other side is wrong. A lot of the thinking for this needs to be done quickly, which is one of the most challenging aspects of debating. Secondly, you need to focus on the most important points of the opposing team's arguments, and finally, remember to criticize the argument, not the individual speaker. To call someone fat, ugly, or a nerd does not make what they say wrong. And it will also lose you marks. Unit fifteen. Prepare to have a formal debate. Exercise three. People in a formal debate have definite roles, and the debate follows a strict sequence. Okay, the people first. There are two teams in the debate. They're called affirmative and negative. Each team normally has three speakers. Now for the procedure: the teams take turns to speak. The affirmative team starts with their first speaker. Next, the first negative speaker presents that team's position. Then the second affirmative speaker speaks. After that, the second negative speaker, and so on. Each speaker does two things: they state or restate their team's argument, and they argue against the other team's position. Arguing against the other team's ideas is called rebuttal. The first two speakers on each team should give new information, but the third speaker shouldn't. Their job is to present a closing summary of their team's position. Unit fifteen. Prepare to have a formal debate. Exercise four. In a formal debate, a panel of judges or adjudicators decides which team has won. They do this by awarding marks to each team for three aspects of their speech. Forty marks are awarded for matter, the content of the speech, which should consist of arguments. And supporting examples. A further twenty marks are awarded for method. Does the team present a united argument? Do they support each other? Is each individual speech clearly structured? Is rebuttal done in an organized way with each point addressed? Another forty marks are awarded for manner. How you present what you say. For example. Does the speaker use cue cards? Does he or she have good eye contact with the audience? Is their voice clear and audible? What about hand gestures? Are there any nervous habits? Having decided the marks for each team, the judges announce the winner of the debate. Unit fifteen. Prepare to do a project. Exercises two and three. Speaker one. It was absolutely amazing. They say there were around twenty thousand people there. Lots of hippies and new age types, but normal people too. For some people, it's just another festival, but you can see for others there's a very strong spiritual dimension. I mean, the stones have been there for four thousand five hundred years. And you see pagans and druids. 
It's a real step back in time. There is the most incredible feeling as the sun comes up over the stones. A kind of connection back with our ancestors, knowing you're seeing the same thing they did all those years ago. Speaker 2 It was a strange kind of day. I mean, in theory, we were going to see horse racing, but no one was paying a lot of attention to that. It was all about seeing people and being seen. They're really quite strict about what you wear. We were in the grandstands where, in theory, you can wear anything, but everyone was still quite smart. And in the more exclusive areas, people wear these incredible outfits, like they're going to a wedding or something. Of course, the really famous thing is the women's hats. I don't really understand what that's all about. It's also incredibly posh. Loads of ridiculous upper-class accents. It's nothing like the real Britain. I found it quite uncomfortable, to be honest. Speaker 3 It was a lot of fun, a really good day out, and a real mix of people. Locals, tourists, lots of families. There are all kinds of events, all the typical ones. You know, tossing the caber when they throw this huge pole, tug of war when the two teams pull on opposite ends of a rope. Lots of games with lifting and carrying. Some of the guys are really strong. It's very impressive. And of course, they're all in traditional dress, tartan and kilts. There's something quite historical about it. You can imagine similar games taking place centuries ago. There's also a lot of music, traditional pipe bands, which is OK if you like bagpipes, but isn't really my idea of fun and Highland dancing. We had a good time and it all felt, well, really Scottish. Leave a like and subscribe.